Welcome to I've Never Read Discworld, the most uh, ridiculous name for a podcast about two guys reading Discworld. Um, we're old, we're new, there's some stuff about borrowing, and Nanny Og is plenty blue. That was pretty good. Uh, that was the voice of Andy Luke, who is our new traveller on his Discworld journey, for those who may not be aware. I'm PJ Hart. I've seen it all before, I've done it all before. And this month we are discussing lords and ladies this world novel number try and say that quickly five times this world novel number what 14 15 15, lost kind that's a good sign isn't it i think it actually kind of is because certainly when i was reading these books the first time around particularly the ones that were coming out around this time in the early to mid 90s that i was obviously then discovering a bit later like we didn't really worry too much about reading them in publication order you know we were just picking up whichever books had the characters you liked in them or which had like the craziest sounding concepts and for that reason i'm actually not quite sure how i've ended up with this so for our video viewers if there are any i am holding in my hand currently soft back cover copy of lords and ladies which I still have in my possession. And interestingly, I've lost so many of like my favorite Discworld books, but I still have this one. And I didn't love it at the time. Like the first time I read it, I didn't love it. So <laughs> how it's managed to survive, I'm not, I'm not really quite sure. But the, this rereading of it has certainly been illuminating, shall we say. Well, I, uh, this, I got this from Stack's Bookshop. It was the first full book that was missing from my brother Gavin's collection. Oh, yeah. So I had an audible credit to waste and I went and got the audio as well. Um, so I've listened to uh, both Terry's book, um, full prose and Nigel Planer's full reading of it. So uh, back cover, let's... Oh, sorry, of course I... I... Oh, or did we do the... We didn't do the date. What, 92 was this... First published? Oh yeah, because you, because your 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 copy is missing this in vital information. I I have to do it. Uh, yeah, it's too it's too much pressure. November ninety two. Copyright Terry and Lynn Pratchett, nineteen ninety two. My copy, reprinted nineteen ninety seven. So will, will we go straight into the back blurb. Let's go. The fairies are back, but this time they don't just want your teeth. It's a good tagline. Granny Weatherwax and her tiny coven are up against real elves. It's midsummer night, no time for dreaming, with full supporting cast of dwarfs, wizards, trolls, Morris dancers, and one yeah. orangutan, and lots of hey nonny nonny and blood all over the place. So, not, not giving a huge amount away there. It's uh, not, um, cover illustration by Josh Kirby. Now, uh, we were going to put up some more covers during the podcast for the video watchers um but i i'm not really like i said i don't look at the kirby cover until after and it's it's okay i mean it does that thing that kirby does where there's it's it's a, he does beautiful paintings but as a cover composer for disc world so there's, there's loads of traffic on the front and nothing on the back which are very minimal stuff on the back which leads to big empty spaces it's really um, interesting when you put Kirby's, we'll do that now, Kirby's covers in, in publication beside the original painted work without yeah, the labels. Yeah, because um, you can see there's probably actually a lot of the, the that detail of uh, the elf character, I assume it's the king, um, lost on the spine there, actually. So yeah, that'd be an interesting comparison for sure. I've not got into looking at the other covers, although uh, just aside from a glance, but uh, yeah. I was going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, impressed by your restraint when it comes to like, <laughs> not even looking at covers, not even reading blurbs. Well, we'll, we'll dive straight into um, what we thought first time around. Let's build up to me because I'm the star attraction here. Of course. Okay. What do you, what do you remember about reading this? first time around not not a lot um except that it kind of confused me and unsettled me a little bit um which is why i'm sort of slightly surprised that i've managed to hold on to my physical copy of it i think there was just maybe a little bit too much going on for me when i was young i assume i read this as i say i've got a 1997 copy of it so i would have been at the youngest 
doing the maths, 11 or 12, but I think I probably read it maybe when I was like 14 or 15 actually, and was probably just a bit like fed up with Shakespeare at that point of my schooling, <laughs> you know, and Midsummer Night's Dream's never been like of, of the Shakespeare that I, I do actually like and appreciate, like Midsummer Night's Dream is not really up there, if I'm being honest, like I, I would struggle to maybe put my finger on exactly why that is, but like, I'd be much more up for a Macbeth party, as we've already had, than I would be for a Midsummer's party. Do you um, find you have a demarcation point from Midsummer Night's Dream before you read Gaiman's Treatment and after you read Gaiman's Treatment? No, because I've never gone back and, and, and read the original prose or the original play since school, to be honest. Um, but yeah, maybe I should. You know, I feel like hopefully I, as a much more grown adult and writer, I would probably appreciate a lot of the old Shakespeare that I kind of disregarded when I was younger now um, and put that on my bucket list. Maybe we can do it. I've never read Shakespeare podcast <laughs> or done with this world. Um, some other stuff in this that I think kind of threw me a little bit was like just how different the portrayal of elves and fairies are compared to like what we're used to, uh, especially in Irish mythology, I guess. But in retrospect, it's, it's, it's a great twist, you know, to have, to have them be like a force of evil or force of a malevolent force rather than like a benign one. So I just thought like these big concepts, like this big parody of a play that I didn't particularly like and this like complete 180 on like ingrained mythology or, or cultural mythology felt just like kind of a lot to take in maybe over the course of this story. Well, you know, we've had a lot of these back cover blurbs have said the funniest Terry Pratchett novel ever, and I've not really agreed. But this one, the, the joke to page ratio is, I think it's certainly the highest. I don't know if it's my favourite book, probably not, but I, I giggled all the way through. Now, one of the slight disadvantages for me, Andy's really, really good, really good at hiding from spoilers. He's, despite the fact that some of these books are, you know, well over 30 years old uh the thing i think sometimes that uh, i miss out on on these rereads books that i read when i was young and didn't particularly understand all that well when i come back to reread them i can't be surprised by them because like i still have a vague recollection of the events at least whereas i think you you sort of implied that maybe you did find this book a lot more surprising it kind of defied your expectations is that fair to say it's it's constantly full of surprises there was one thing what, what I which I thought was was for sure going to happen and that's Magrat and Verens are not going to marry and that's that's completely wrong um you get why the, did you why, why why did you think that um well there's a there's a bit of a you don't break up the band right because if, if Magrat marries Verens then she won't become you know she won't be a witch and yeah it's a brave choice I think um, It'd be interesting well, I suppose we could have this conversation now, you know, whether this was intended at one stage to be the last Witches book, because we've had Equal Rights, Weird Sisters, Witches Abroad. Like, we're actually, this is actually the fourth. Yeah. I mean, if we count Equal Rights, which we sort of should, I guess, mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, it's either the third or fourth book, depending on who's counting. And were they thinking, yeah, or were they? Was Terry thinking, you know, it's a natural kind of stopping point to break up the coven and let my grab become queen. And then maybe we revisit Lanker and Granny, or maybe we don't, you know. And respect, because these four books have been so strong that Terry could have just written witches only and still turned in a tidy income. Totally. And obviously, yeah. his imagination is about much more than that. Yeah, and then, you know, bringing the wizards in, is maybe, is maybe part of that, you know? Yes. Okay. Kaboom. Crossover time. This got me so excited. Just, and, and I hadn't realized that I had so much love for the Wizards because this new Wizards 3.0 or whatever kind of sneaks up on you. It's, it's fully formed in moving pictures, but there's so much going on in moving pictures to look at. They're mm. very, back in the very next book and they're not, um, he went in with the dead Windle Poons or the undead Windle Poons, they're not in their best light. And just when they, yeah, they, they come into this, it was, yeah, I did my, um, my oh, good dance, yeah, because I it, it wasn't an element of the story that immediately rang a bell for me. It's like, oh, yeah, the the, the wizards are in this, and then it got it did get me thinking about Reaper Mind going, like, oh, yeah, are they just shoehorned in here again, just kind of. 
because it needs a B story or whatever. But um, no, I I think less is more in this one. Like they don't get anywhere near the amount of page time as they do in in Reaper Man, and that's probably for the best. And like you were saying about the jokes per page, like a lot of that comes in their involvement, especially in the later set pieces, I guess. And to just properly like see the librarian literally out in the wilds of just crumping dudes is is awesome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah some totally worth it. I think it's the first time we've ever had him explicitly go like this is a sequel because yeah, the return of their return from their trip in moving pictures. No, in Witches Abroad. It like directly kind of precedes this and there's things that happen that inform the story here. And that you know to, to bring Casananda to continue the the uh, the nanny Casananda romance <laughs> as part of that. And that's just like as much direct continuity for that level of character, I think, you know, for one of these kind of like comedy supporting characters, that's like as much continuity as they ever get. So yeah, it was cool, cool to see, to see him back in it. And it does such a great job of reestablishing Casanunda and Verence and, and sort of giving them the, the, uh, the spark or, or more than the spark that they had in their previous appearances. Yeah, for sure. I think it's, it's a skill that I think fantasy authors, you know, authors of these big, series tend to develop is that you know it's it's absolutely not essential to have read which is abroad to read this and i can say for sure if i definitely read them in order at the time either because he, do, he does do a really good job and the fact that casananda is set up away initially set up in this book away from nanny and then they, they they don't really meet until after the midpoint and the varen's migrad thing even if you don't know the backstory of it it's such such an archetypal story, I guess, of, you know, commoner marine king kind of stuff that, like, you don't really need it explained. If you don't want it explained, you know, you're not missing out on very much, I don't think. So, yeah, it's really well handled. You could have you done without the author's note, probably would have got away with it. Yeah. Um, and, and the um, and one thing that did shock me about the ending is, uh, so Magrat is no longer part of this triumvirate now you know ties and a lot of what she has been taught and not taught by esme and gaitha have really contributed to how she reacts and behaves valiantly in the second yeah. half of the story can um, i just say it makes me so uncomfortable to hear you refer to the witches by their first names <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it's just not the done thing <laughs> there's, there's more coming there's more coming but what's um, what's, what's actually even funnier is that, <laughs> like you, you know the way like um there's like trends for like names for kids so like when terry's writing this book esme is like an old lady name and that's why he's given it to to granny like her her nickname is literally granny but now like there's kids in my daughter's class called Esme because it's like come back around and you're just like, you, you kind of have to walk, tread carefully around them in case they break out the headology on you, you know? <laughs> Shall we get into... Well, I did the blurb, so you can do the first, you can do the first uh, summary. All right. Part one, there was a badger in the privy, pages one to 76. Separated by half centuries, two sullen young witches talked to creatures beyond a circle. Our Jason has death in a smithy. Returned from Genoa, my grad is Damari Verence the second. So what would she want to be a witch for? Esme and Gaitha discover dancing near the dancers and the corpse of William Scrope. The Arch Chancellor receives an invitation. My grad doesn't feel cut out for palace life. Esme puts a, a name to a mind. Elf. Good, good setup. Yeah, all the strands laid out, you know, really, really nicely, really ready to get going. The only one that doesn't immediately seem like it's going to go anywhere is the the visit that, that uh, Jason receives from death. But then obviously the, the business of shoeing and shoeing horses with iron and stuff all, all comes back in a big way later. But as a setup, I, yeah, I love flashbacks. I love seeing young granny. And again, that, that even that flashback, you know, which which could easily just exist as this little prologue snippet that that comes back in a big way at the end too. So I just feel like something I obviously missed totally when I read it as a kid was to how like tightly constructed this story is, you know, 
Yeah, it it really is. Okay, it's quite quite a, a little nuance. One, I'm only really spotting it now, but I have, you know, in, in how it it links to the end. Um, but yeah, right the way through, we're we're full of little seeds that that by the end that are, have grown into a full blown tree time. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. I haven't had that for a while. Uh, the dancers at the dancers, the, the other, the wannabe witches, I think it's also possibly something that rub, rubbed me the wrong way as a kid because I was like kind of okay. a goth, kind of a goth kid. And uh, like ter Terry's obviously taking the piss out of goth kids here massively. So I, w I wondered, was I possibly offended by that? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Upon my first read, he's like, well, this, this guy wants to make me read Shakespeare and he wants to take the piss out of goths. Like, what's what's going on here? I'm just trying to read a book. I'm just trying to have fun. Why, why are you attacking me, Sir Terry? So in retrospect, reading it now, you know, as, as a grown up and being able to laugh at my young self, like it, those, those scenes are absolutely brilliant. They really make you smile. Yeah. Yeah, and actually worth worth mention, um, Nigel Planer's audio reading of this, um, he does, yeah, it's really good, it's like nine hours long, full thing, he gets about 10 words wrong, or you know, misses or adds, it, really, really good, but his, wow. um, his uh, oh, I've forgotten her name, the lead goth. Um, uh, the, it's not Diamanda or whatever. Lead goth Diamanda, thank you, good, yeah. good catch. Um, it's actually voiced as a sort of a really art by Nigel Planer as a really arrogant nail from the young ones. That's what you want for that. And there, that level of kind of lack of self awareness. There's a, uh, yeah. And there's a, a sense of entitlement to her as yeah, well. Yeah, big time. Uh, Neil probably wouldn't face down a witch in a duel, I don't think it's maybe the only slight difference, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so a really good, a really good opening in terms of like all this stuff pays off, even though it's not immediately apparent how it's going to. And I think if we're going to have wizards, as I say, I think it works better. The amount of wizard stuff in this one feels a bit more right. But then as a result of that, because we're not going to see them as often as we did maybe in Reaper Man, like get them set up at least and get, get the whole kind of the B story kind of cooking in terms of like who's coming to Lanker and sort of why and like what the dynamic's going to be between them and that, you know, the Arch-Chancellor Bursar dynamic is obviously something that really tickles him. And I, I think that also like probably went over my head quite a bit as a kid as well, like because I hadn't, been in that that world of like adult kind of power dynamics really you know because when you're a kid all adults have power over you and you don't really you're not really that concerned about which adults have power over each other and then so this the dynamic between the arch chancellor and the bursar it's hard to relate to but obviously now as a grown-up you're like oh god <laughs> yeah i would be taking the dried frog pills too if i had to work for this guy <laughs> yeah so it wasn't quite the dried frog pills are for his stress because the bursar stresses out at anything within the arch chancellor's vicinity my reading of it now you know having sort of seen the bursar's mental state deteriorate <laughs> over every book that he's been in since red killy became arch chancellor it sort of feels like yeah, he has to take the pills as a result of stress, and Red Gilly is the source of that stress. Ponder Stibbins is back. He was Victor Tugglebane's um, stand-in. He got Victor's papers, is that right? And so would have oh, yeah. been a super exam, mm -hmm. a super easy exam, which I, uh, explains why somebody so young has been elevated to a lecturer in um, quantum continuum and things. Yeah. All, all the kind of the the magical equivalent of yeah quantum physics and stuff I guess uh, yeah that's right so I sort of I, yeah I always have to be careful with the spoilers and I've sort of forgotten a little bit that like Ponder doesn't really become like an established character in his own right until this book and he exists to to bring like ideas of science into the magical realm, you know, sort of equivalencies that help us understand how magic works in this world and also to take the piss out of science and scientists. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be uh, quite fun as part of that ensemble. Yeah, for sure. And 
as you sort of alluded to, I guess, you know, the, the gang of wizards that, hopefully it's not too much of a spoiler to say, is going to return is coalescing again. Yeah, now that Wendell, Wendell Poons is out, Ponder Stebbins is in, I guess, is this like the current lineup, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, you can, you can kind of, you can see the dynamics sort of between that group becoming much stronger for sure. There, there's stuff I've left out. So there's like uh, crop circles appearing everywhere in in uh, the Arch Chancellor's porridge, is it? And yeah, yeah. In uh, Nanny Og's um, nephew grandson's Chris uh, palad. Uh huh. Uh -huh. I didn't obviously didn't clock this or any of this like the first time around. Uh, but the fact that porridge is made from oats, which is a crop, obviously. And then yeah, the crest like the, the like the tiniest crop imaginable. So yeah, it's it's it's, it's, it's very clever and so funny. the idea of them being crop circles being supernatural. We don't maybe necessarily think about it in those terms, do we? Because we would always think from a kind of later twentieth century pop culture perspective of it being like a, a sci fi thing, like an alien aliens related thing. But I suppose it must be something that exists in kind of earlier mythologies too. I thought it was quite clever. I liked it a lot. And obviously the dancers, that's a circle and that's really clearly the epicenter then or one of the epicenters of this kind of stuff. So yeah, it's set up really nicely and some really good gags there too. Um, it's yeah, there's there's a good, um, good sense of tone builds around dancers. And um, I'm going to I'm going to do it as being Gaith is relationship with them um and that sort of sense of preventative magic and that there's something like nanny can't even say to jason the lords and ladies because it's mm. you know even spelling it out um, only that they're in the the smithy um yeah the hush the voice and um is that is that something to yeah. So, it's a really good way of making your villains terrified. <laughs> There's yeah. no, it's great. Like as as a narrative device, you just be like, can't even say these names, and it's been ripped off. Not ripped off. I mean, it's it's a trick as old as time, I guess. Like Harry Potter has probably made it most famous most recently, I guess, for like you know a villain so awful that you he can't even be named. You know, he he must not be named or whatever it is. So like the idea of the power of names and the power of belief and the power of knowing things like it feels like there's a stronger reason to deploy that narrative device here rather than just oh make the bad guys terrifying we get we get a look into uh, nanny Og's other son i don't think we focused in on sean so much yeah sean because he's just like the, the the jack of all trades at the at the castle i think he has been there but yeah, we, we haven't really spent as much time with him. He's, he's got a lot to do. <laughs> he's busy. He's yeah. got the wedding. He's <laughs> yeah, he got the castles to look after. He's still got he's a, the entire standing army of Lanker as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, Sean Og. To, to see the extended Og clan. Because usually, you know, they're there in the background and then yeah. the witches are off having their other adventures, but they're a lot more involved in this. And uh, and Pusey as well, a little Pusey, sticky Pusey. <laughs> definitely, definitely relate to that a lot more now as an adult. Is that is that a name he gets, sticky Pusey? Because it yeah, well they refer <laughs> yeah, that Nanny definitely. Or I can't remember whether it's Granny or Nanny refers to him as like the stickiest child <laughs> in the land. <laughs> like yeah, they do be sticky. Nobody knows how they get that way. Um, and Magrat is um, dipping her toes in the, the soon-to-be queen life. Um, I, I, it's, it's kind of hard to chop up this book when we're talking about it, uh, and any of these books, into these sort of five bits when you'd much rather just, just talk about it as a whole. Um, but I know we've both agreed that Magrat isn't anywhere near as strong a character as as granny or nanny um but i i think and i, th I think terry really knew that and has worked really hard to to build her um so we had the witches abroad was very migrat focused mm -hmm. and here she's a big part of it and 
she she's de- she definitely goes on court through this book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's there's a lot seemingly happening here that's attempted to redress that to sort of to do right by Magra in terms of her place in that the three book narrative, you know, the three books that she's appeared in and she has always been the soppy one or the wet blanket. And these are like literal phrases that are used to describe her in the books. So yeah, to give her this like triumphant moment, like it has to start from this place, I guess, where she is potentially giving up being a witch, which is even though she's not, or she doesn't think she's that good at it, at least it has a purpose. And then she's just kind of wandering the halls of this castle, feeling really unmurred. So that's like, you know, from, from, that place at the start of her journey to where she's going to end up it it does sort of feel right you know it, it feels like the right place to start her for this particular leg of her journey this is the weak magrat this mm-hmm. is um the magrat who gets into arguments with granny and storms off in a huff um acts really sort of immature and i i, I guess there's something being said here about the about the immaturity of youth that honestly kids don't know jack <laughs> <laughs> um and yeah I, I mean obviously granny weatherwax isn't always in the right shocker there um, yeah but yeah most of the time i guess yeah i think just having somebody and if you think about like you know not that long ago in Terry's life where he was a little bit less kind of secure in what he was doing and he'd sort of bounce in between newspapers and then PR jobs and stuff. And you're like, maybe if you're him, you're thinking, well, what actually is my life going to be like? I'm an, I am an adult now. And at that point he is kind of an adult and he has a wife and he's got a kid. Or, and so do you just like settle down to be a PR man and maybe write, write the occasional novel or do you become Terry Pratchett and like knock out two or three books a year and like smash every one of them and become super best selling and, and all the rest of it. So like about finding your true self, maybe there's something in that. I'm not sure. Yeah. I think that's a much kinder way of looking at it. Like Magrat knows she wants to marry parents. That's the clearest action that comes across here. Um, we can put the, the uh, walking away from witching down to at least for this narrative down to a little tantrum. Um, but she knows she wants to be married to Verence, and that's, yeah, that's something for her. Yeah, character. we come come across later, like what the different definitions of being a queen or whatever. Being queen doesn't dictate who she has to be. You know, it could be the other way around. Uh, but with that in mind, we're definitely jumping ahead. I'm going to read part two before we run out of parts to talk about. The lords and ladies are trying to find a way. It's pages 77 to 150. I'm changing it. Granny meets with the coffin of Diamanda and challenges her to a duel, attended by the going to be queen and little Pusey Og. The Lanker Morris men work on the entertainment. On the road, the academicals pick up Kathananda. We learn about the trousers of time and Millie, oh, Hodge and Mr. Brooks, and the fair folk and Iron. Diamanda catches up with Granny at the dancers, and the elves try to catch up with them. So that's quite a lot. It's quite, it is quite going a lot. on already. Yeah. yeah. Usually, I'm the one who says that, but I'm glad that you you, <laughs> you pointed it out this time. Yeah, I sort of remember being vaguely surprised on the reread that like we got to see the elves as soon as this. I sort of had it in my mind, and it sort of feels like it's built up a little bit because we can't say their names, and they're this big force of mystery. And because we had that glimpse in the prologue, I was like, oh, well, that means the, you, you get away with holding off on revealing them again until much later. But the like little encounter that uh, Granny and Diamanda have in like the elf realm just like raises the stakes so massively and it, it, it crystallizes so clearly like Terry's version of this mythology. And it's quite scary. I think that this also probably unsettled me a little bit as a kid too, that like, you could get stuck in another universe and tortured forever by elves. Like that's fucking <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> right. So yeah, I thought it was quite, dare I say, brave move to like 
to put them in that danger kind of this early, sort of before the midpoint? I, I think there's quite a few instances in this book where um, there's a feeling of real horror. Yeah. Yeah. And I was a total, again, even though, like I said earlier, I was like this goth kid, I was also a total wuss, like, especially about horror. Like, I was so not into horror movies back then. I didn't read any, like, horror books. I didn't read Stephen King or anything like that. So, yeah, I think I find this all quite uh, unsettling, <laughs> to put it mildly. It's, it's, a, it's a weird sort of, it's, it's, it's a horror that goes with that other voice in your head that says everything's going to be all right for these characters. It's going to be fine, but you can't help feeling both emotions simultaneously yeah and like it totally might not be all right for diamanda because like you just met this girl she's like obviously this force of antagonism and you can definitely see her just being used as a narrative device for granny like if she died granny would obviously blame herself and it would spur granny on to do something especially because it's so early in the story so i think that's part of what makes it effective is that it really feels, it doesn't really feel like Granny's in danger, but it for sure feels like Diamanda's in danger, right? Yeah. Um, and at the at the start of this section, they have their duel in um, the courtyard. Uh, to, yeah, it's good fun. Who can, who can stare at the sun for the longest? Um, it's quite a it's quite a long section, but you could get perfectly worth the page count. Yeah, because again, if maybe if you haven't read the sort of previous witch books, let's say you're diving in here and you don't have that full grasp of like the subtle differences between like diamandas, which magic and headology as granny would call it. I think you want to have a sequence like this. It just kind of dresses the table again for like, this is how this world works and this is how these characters kind of interact with it. And also it's just like, it's just fun to have the old dog go up against the upstart kind of kid. And I think na Nanny and Pusey's influence on in it is just the icing on the cake, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Esme and Gaitha just do have that magical relationship between them where um, for the most part, they can give each other so much crap and it's it's forgotten about. Uh, you know, it's it's the scores are balanced. Um, yeah it's such a it just feels like such a lived in relationship like it feels so authentic and so real yeah. and i mean and, and terry wasn't that old when he was writing this but these these characters both those characters granny and and then he both feel that like they've lived a proper life together as well you know uh and that that only deepens as it kind of goes on and when you think back to the first time we met granny on her own in equal rights that wasn't really there yet but it's so deeply entrenched in, in their world now is just that relationship that, and I think maybe that's why to see Migrat potentially leave the coven, it never felt to me like that wasn't a possibility because I always sort of felt that there was much stronger, much more invested in in the granny nanny relationship through, through the the trilogy as it is, I guess, up to, to this point. So yeah, it's great. Um, yeah, so it's like component parts coming together once Nanny Ogg's in the mix. Mm. And I think, it, getting a bit ahead of ourselves, but I think it works the same way for Red Cully, which is a, a genuine surprise because, uh, you know, Gra Gra Granny Weatherwax should never have met a man. <laughs> but Red Cully is just such a natural fit. And right away, you can hear them bouncing off each other so well. Yeah. Um, I love and you I can picture you can begin to picture them being younger and, and having that um energy. Yeah, yeah, that, and that that's all part of what helps helps us feel so well fleshed out, I guess. <laughs> I think we actually skipped past it. It was in the first section maybe where um Red Killy's like trying really hard to reminisce. Like he's trying to have these like wistful memories on the journey and he keeps getting interrupted by just nonsense. <laughs> Yes, this is the scene where um, Ponder is teaching him about multiple universes and Rick yeah. is trying to work out why he didn't invite himself to his wedding. The, the Trousers of Time is absolutely iconic in terms of, uh, I guess, especially now where like even mainstream audiences are sick of the multiverse. <laughs> you know, yes. like we've had too many multiverses, frankly. So, like, Terry, Terry's already taken the piss out of that back here in the early 90s with the trousers of time. And yeah, 
multi-universe saturation, isn't it? Yeah, well, yeah, this is it. So, yeah, very prescient, very ahead of its time, for sure. Yeah. Um, the Lanker Morris, man, this is perhaps the only weak spot I felt with the book. Um, the, the, the Morris men just didn't really engage me. I just, I felt the scenes with them often went on much too long, that the characters were a little interchangeable. Um, yes. Again, something that definitely put me off on my first reading for sure. I th I'm I'm not even a hundred percent sure if I was aware of the concept of Morris Men at the time that I would have first read this, <laughs> and if you're not English, and not even all English people, we have this as a cultural touchstone. But so I guess you have to be like at least semi-rural and from certain parts of the country to kind of to appreciate jokes at the expense of Morris dancers. I suppose is that so probably fair to say? Yeah, because you know, I just don't care. I just don't care about Morris care. dancing. I don't care. Well, so, is is Morris dancing the same as Maypole dancing? No, right. So again, this is something we should have looked up probably before the pod. <laughs> but it's funny the you description. Don't. It's to yeah. I'm like yeah. I'm like speaking on this as if I know what I'm talking about. My understanding of Morris dancing is, it's like, uh, do you know the Arma rhymers? No. You heard of them? No. So I think they're like they're a local ish equivalent we have where it's like almost wicker man sort of style, like getting getting up in like straw outfits and like doing all these weird elaborate dances. So they don't do it round the maple. I think they do it with each other and they're like they're choreographed specific dances that all go back hundreds and hundreds of years and they all have specific meanings. And there's also like little plays that they can do, like little scenes, and that's kind of the point of this, I think, is having the Morris men doing doing a play like that's something that they do do but they're not putting on shakespeare or whatever but they do these like little kind of scenes i think but they do it in these quite elaborate straw costumes i feel really bad now because i think i know at least two morris men oh really <laughs> do, and, and do we need dense to get a morris watch oh maybe i feel i feel like there's maybe more morris going on here than i was aware of let us know in the comments it's, it's, is it, it's more widespread. Yeah, I totally, that's a very uneducated kind of explanation of my understanding of Morrisman, but I can uncategorically say as a kid, I did not care at all. <laughs> so they're plot functional to the story, which we'll, we'll talk about. And there's a great beat in, in part five, but. Um... Yeah, it's unfair to say that they don't earn their place, but I would agree with you that maybe some of the scenes are a bit long and that they remind me a little bit of the elucidated brethren where it's kind of like, slightly right. inter slightly interchangeable working class characters and like the dialogue between them is great like they bicker and there's some good jokes and stuff in there and some nice shakespeare references and stuff but like you're not invest except for sean you're not in no sorry jason you're not invested in any of the others particularly and like the the little running gag with the naming conventions so it's actually quite difficult to keep track of which one's which because they're all called like baker but baker's a carpenter and carpenter's a plumber or whatever and it gets a little bit confusing i mean always 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 give sir terry pratchett the benefit of the doubt <laughs> every time but yeah still more more dancing not not something i'm necessarily relating to even now but should check them out. Yeah, because mummers, isn't that the thing? Or am I getting yeah. mummers and Morris dancers mixed up? I think my explanation of Morris dancing might have actually been about mummers. But do mummers Morris dance? Or do Morris dancers mum? I don't know. I, I think we need... Morris we need dancers to... watch. <laughs> yeah, somebody needs to set us right on this. Um, on the road, the academic roles pick up Casanunda. Um, and he's he was... He was pretty glorious last time around. He was full on. He's quite a flash character, quite a, a refreshing bolt. A bit, yeah. a bit hack, hackneyed or a bit, is that the word? Or he's a bit irritating, but um, when he's on form, when his character's on form, I think um, his appearance here only improves on the last, the last time around. He's quite refreshing, quite fun. Yeah, I was definitely surprised to see him come back because it, it, it felt like a character that was very much of that fairy tale world that we were in in, uh, in the final act of Witches Abroad. 
because because he, he that's what he's there. He's this big romantic character who's sweeping maidens off their feet and stuff. So he felt very much part of the fairy tale. So to see him kind of out of the fairy tale, and now he's in this kind of like uh, folk horror wicker man kind of story <laughs> instead is like it's an interesting choice. And like you say, it kind of works. Um. I don't know, the, the Treasures of Time we've talked about already, and that was something that came up in Mark Burrow's show. Yeah. Um, if you go and see it's still playing, um, link in the description. And it's 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 part of the thing where what I have seen going through this book, there's a lot of stuff that might have been like footnotes in previous novels. Mm. And, and and sort of the way the footnotes have grown, it's almost like they're they're growing up onto the page themselves. Yeah, no, I definitely do. Like, like all the kind of implied interactions between the parallel universes, I guess, is I think what you're getting at. Like that sort of stuff feels like it would have been a footnote maybe in previous books. Yeah, it's, and it, it'd be interesting to know. I'm, I'm sure he's probably spoke about it somewhere. Um, like what qualifies something to be included on the page rather than in the footnotes. And I think for me in this, it feels like the stuff that happens or that we believe happens in parallel universes in the treasures of time in this story like it affects the characters like it affects how they feel and it affects how they act to a degree so it has to earn its place on the page it's not just a throwaway guy because you can always you know i imagine if not terry certainly terry's editor and publishers would have been terrified that people aren't reading the footnotes you know that they would just skip them so you can't have anything that is like important to like a character's arc in the footnotes really can you otherwise yeah. even if you do read them they just feel like throwaway kind of you know so i think it's a really fine balance and i think he's obviously nailed it like he knows he knows himself really clearly what's part of the story and what what's part of the footnotes yeah just to be clear i mean so a few examples and it's like a tonal thing that you know we might find the footnotes the dancers the long man the fair <laughs> folk i the properties of iron yeah, this is like a tonal thing. They're all on the page now. I like it a lot. Um, and I think as well, there's it's so rare to have a footnote that's not a gag. So unless he has, I think he's you know he was so strict with like his joke writing and stuff too. So unless he has like, yes, he needs exposition about the long man or whatever. But unless he also has a good joke about it, he's not going to put it as a footnote. Um, that that scene of uh. Diamanda at crossing the dancers and having be bailed out by Esme, I think, is one of those sort of horror moments that we were were talking about. This is where Nanny is doing or Granny is doing headology into the horse. Is that so? Yeah, yeah. And it's got like, does it want to have? It's like she's got six legs all at once, but they're in two different bodies, and then when she pulls out of the horse or the horse is trying to or when she's disabling the horse the horse is trying to work out if it has two legs or four legs but decides on three yeah yeah the borrowing yeah um yeah so headology is just like psychology and then borrowing is like when she puts her brain or puts her mind into other animals brains and i've mentioned it before when it comes up in the previous stories like even that kind of creeps me out i feel like there's a bit of body horror involved there like you say like this this creature doesn't know how many legs it has. Like that's some Cronenberg stuff right there, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, so that that that's part of it for sure. Part of the kind of creepiness of, of these stories, and then that idea of borrowing animals pays off big time in the finale again. Uh, There's so much good writing around borrowing that you have to you have to sort of look after the creature you've borrowed and treat them afterwards. Yeah. And you know, talking about this with you, I realized I, I've sort of rhymed off a few quotations fairly easily and I don't have a good memory for this sort of stuff it's been unintentional and that's just shows the quality of Terry's writing that it you know it lends itself to this this easy quoting um you know you think of of any great films you've got and and you know how you will run out great lines and yeah so yeah absolutely and uh, when we spoke to Mark and hopefully you've heard him kind of tell us like what a treat we were in for, for this next run of books that we had lined up. And 
that's part of what you're saying. I think, you know, that Terry's just on fire at this part of the series. Like, the stories are so well constructed. The ideas are really big. The lines are really memorable. The jokes are really good. It's just all the pieces are fitting into place. It's just like there's no element of his writing that's kind of lagging behind any of the others at this stage, I think, you know. Uh, you want to do the next one? Yeah, sure. Cool. Why not? Cool. Um, was that part three? Is it part three? Let us in right now, Sean Og. Bagrat tends to Diamanda, and Verence sees the elf in his dungeon. The Morris men drink. The librarian is not stopped by bandits or trolls. Ridkily returns home. With wedding jitters, Magrat loosens Diamanda's bonds and discovers Varence has kept secrets. In the Great Hall, Nanny reunites with Casananda, <laughs> Granny, and Ridkily stand on an old bridge. Good times. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. Gets a little bit misty eyed in places in this section, doesn't it? Mm. PJ has yeah. been changing my text from uh, Gaitha to Nanny and Esme to Granny. So, uh, yes, I expect you to refer to Magrat as Mrs. Garlic. Okay, yeah. Miss, or Queen Queen Garlic. <laughs> yeah, what's, what's the soon correct? To soon, queen. To, soon to be Queen Garlic, yeah. Uh, no, to totally fair and yeah, absolutely arbitrary decision on, on my part and the fact that you put so much good work into writing these summaries and then I change them willy-nilly is, is a huge disrespect. I appreciate that. So but, this is still my rat. At, I mean, she's she's doing her healer medicine woman thing and the um, granny and nanny come to her with this problem and they're not bothered about her storming out it's you know what needs done mm -hmm. and and she tries to uh get in her little snark but pretty quickly realizes she should just get on with business yeah and I've, if you are of that mind you know if you're if one of the kind of dramatic questions that's playing out for you as you read this is will my grat become queen or will my grat remain a witch this is one of the sections and it comes just before the midpoint, I want to say, r roughly around the midpoint, where she has a chance to show off her skills as a witch and she can do something that Granny and Nanny can't do. And then that, that keeps that question alive and it really makes you think. Because up until up until this point, she has been pretty resigned to just becoming queen. And then you're like, oh yeah, Magrat's still got a bit of the witch witchy stuff going on, you know. And maybe there is stuff Granny and Nanny can't do without her. And it, it definitely keeps that question alive for the audience. Yeah, my reading of it is uh, pretty much the same. It's like um, Granny and Nanny actually limit what my grat, um, not what she can do, what she does. Mm. Yeah. And there's a line later where Granny says, um, that girl doesn't know herself, I know her better. Yeah. Um, I know uh, old, old, older people always think that about younger people anyway, but yeah. I think it's when when Magrat's moving out of her cottage, and there's there's chat about how particular types of witches' cottages attract a particular type of witch. So that implies that like you need different types of witches, and that you know maybe if you have a coven of three witches, they should all be like three different types of witch, and like right. should have different strengths. So again, that kind of might lead you to believe that, well, there's no way Magrat could, could give up being a witch then because there'll, there'll be an imbalance because who's going to do all the herb stuff or whatever. And, and props to her, she knows her medicine because remember, she's already dropped her all her magical stuff in the uh, Lanka River. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So she's straight back to work on whatever's available. Yeah, yeah and I think, yeah, well, what Granny, when I mean, Granny does say she knows Magrat better than Magrat, like, yeah, my grad didn't need all the kind of all the dream characters or whatever, but she like she knows her way around the herbs and she knows how to like make poultices and all that kind of like real. That's kind of the real part of her, the bit of her craft that Granny does respect, you know. Um, I think there's there's not I'm I'm not disappointed by Verence in this book. Um I get the feeling there's a there's much, much more of Verence to explore in future books. Yeah. So I'm really hoping that happens. But we do get his relationship with um granny and nanny and i think that's this wonderful that he has such a respect for granny weatherwax like he he seems to totally get her and and just you know respectful distance 
Yeah, Varen's, you're right. Varen's doesn't get a huge amount to do in this book, for sure. But the, what, what little glimpses we do get is that he's, like, pathologically sensible. Like, he's trying to have a parliament. He's trying to do crop rotation. He's just trying to do all this, like, basic, sensible, real-world stuff. And, like, not messing with Granny Weatherwax is probably, like, page one in the book of sensible, you know? <laughs> I was just going to say, where Nigel Planer's audio reading doesn't really work for me is he does Verence as Prince Charles. But just talking mm. through all that, yeah, I can see some of the the comparisons. Verence feels like he's going to be quite a, or is already quite a hands-on king. Yeah, and I think that's maybe where like a, a kind of a Prince Charles characterization I think would feel wrong for me. He didn't have a royal upbringing and stuff, and he just seems to be kind of getting on with it sensibly. I think he, I kind of, I mean, Gordon Brown's not right, but in terms of his like ruling style, I can see him being a bit of a Gordon Brown. I don't know if that's necessarily his personality, but like I think that's how he goes about his business as as a king, you know, as boringly and as sensibly as possible. <laughs> <laughs> now, the next point is a Morris Men drink, and I don't really have anything to say to that, but I would like to ask you: Do you know if um, the Discworld community has organised for? scumble as a as a creatable product or such i don't know and part of the reason why i don't know is because I'm, I'm, I'm terrified to find out <laughs> <laughs> i think i know you say you don't have much to say about the morris man drinking but like i do feel it's important that it, every discworld book like there's a piss up like if nobody gets drunk it doesn't feel like a proper discworld book so yeah, I know we were a bit down on the Mars men before, but they're the ones who get to have the knees up and, and get nice and merry in this book. So fair play to them. Good for them. Uh, we get the librarian out in the on the road to Lanker, um, dealing with bandits and trolls. And uh, it's, it's quite fun wa watching everybody's reaction to that, the, the swiftness with which his violence is uh, deployed and... <laughs> Yeah, um, to see to see yeah. the librarian out in the world is just a joy. And the customs troll is one of those great Discworld concepts that seems so yeah. obvious in retrospect. That's such such a good right. concept that this part of the world the kingdoms are linked by bridges because they're up in the mountains, trolls live under bridges, therefore <laughs> trolls are responsible for customs. <laughs> and I wonder how like People who actually do work in customs, I wonder how they would feel about that characterization. Um, Red Cully, we've known as a uh, is a country man. He like to he's he's got a crossbow again here, which presumably I don't know. Did he use a rifle when he was younger, or did he use a crossbow? In terms of where Discworld is technologically at this point, we're still very much in the world of crossbows. Is like the height of small arms that are available to your discerning hunter so oh, a rifle have been invented at this point in this world no unless somebody wants to write in and tell me otherwise but i'm pretty confident um i think uh, I, me I mentioned fairly early on i think um in equal rights just how much i was i was just blown away by how much environmental description Terry has in these books, and it really all pays off here when Rit Cully returned, returns home to Lanker. Do we feel, I mean, I was a bit confused as to whether Rit Cully's from Lanker or not. It's sort of implied that he like spent the summer there, but oh, is right. that just Actually, because... Actually, you're right, yeah. yeah. But I was wondering, is that because, was that just like his last summer before he left, or was it just one summer? I'm not, I suppose it doesn't really matter, but it was just kind of... Well, we know curious. he was quite good at the magic back then. Uh, so he was just teleporting around willy-nilly, seducing whatever young witches crossed his path, perhaps? Yeah, I, I guess just because of the descriptions we get of Lanker and that the, it, Red Cully's pulling in the country air and stuff that it actually fitted quite tidily. So I was um, stepping yeah. over that sort of one summer thing. But we know um, he tells Granny, or Granny here talking about his relationship with magic and she says he was quite good when he was younger so he must have been on his way to the the university at that point when he was last in Lanker. yeah yeah because that yeah it's the summer before he started university isn't it which is a magical time in in everybody's life surely isn't it I spent all the hard up, work begins uh, i spent mine up the cave hill drinking 
vanilla Coke mixed with various substances. <laughs> um, so uh, where were we? Oh, yes, Magrat, wedding, wedding jitters, um, loosing diamond as bonds, and which is all very, very stupid. Um, she can be a stupid woman. I think this all seems like a lot if you're Magra, I guess, doesn't it? And like it's been brewing now for 200 pages where there's like the party is in full swing. It probably feels like the point of no return for her in terms of like, well, I'm going to be queen tomorrow. Right. And yeah, the fact I think that Diamanda and the elf, like that, all that stuff's happening in the castle and she doesn't know about it. And like, why, why doesn't she know if she's going to live there, if she's going to be the queen? And she's already feeling like a loose end, but then there's stuff happening in the castle that she's not privy to. You can sort of see how that pushes her over the edge, maybe. And and we have the glamour as well. We have the the elves' ability just to influence the people around. Um, and it, it can feel like a bit of a crutch in fantasy stories where you have creatures who can just like, oh, they're just gonna mind control people. <laughs> yeah, we're just gonna that that moves the plot along, but it feels. It like feels like the elves are more like the fawns. Yeah, kind of you're impressed by them. You want to do stuff for them. Exactly. Yeah, and in, and so much time is spent in the earlier sections building it up and building up that dread about them. Then you go, well, yeah, okay, it doesn't feel like too neat of a contrivance because so much time has been spent building it up. Yeah. So this is where we get the uh, yeah the Great Hall, um, Gaitha, Casanunda, Granny, Red Cully. So oh, yeah, so I said it all gets very romantic, you know, in, in parts yeah. of this bit. Yeah. And do we like which if you had to choose, would you rather see Granny and Red Gilly get together or Nanny and Casanunda? It's it's Granny and Red Collie. They're the best, but you know both of them, not just Granny, are just they're kind of they they're meant to be, you know, where here. The, you know they 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 are where they they are. Uh, I think are, are probably best suited there. Not to say that's a movable point. I mean, I'm open to so what comes next. Um, I get the, the trousers feeling of time, as well maybe. that that Nanny and um, Casanunda would just uh, would would be together just for the sake of it anyway. Just to, even despite your question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like who, who am I to keep them apart? Right back at you, do you have a, a favorite pairing? Of those two, yeah, for me, it's definitely Nanny and Casanunda for sure. I love that kind of disparity, just, but also like it's it's as far as we ever get with like, because obviously Nanny's got, well, she thinks she alludes to how many husbands she's had and all the kids that she's had and stuff, but you never like, you don't really see her get flirty except with Casanunda and you'd certainly not for like extended pages in the book except this one so yeah I just it's a joy to read and they're so hilariously mismatched that like I just can't get enough of it they're a lot of fun do we want to go on to the next part part four no one's going to invade are they it's pages 230 to 306 treats Geither to dinner at the goat and bush as me and Red Cully face off against a unicorn, and then there was one. The entertainment has a disturbing interlude. The bees are angry. Sean Og takes the path of the retreating back. My grad visits the armory and gives the elves some royal direction. Questioning her subjects, she learns an army is ransacking Lanker. The Morris men dance away from the invaders, and Cassinunda learns how to use a crowbar. <laughs> wow. Yeah, sometimes just reading these back, it's just so much fun because it takes you right to that journey again. Absolutely. Yeah. And sort of in a similar way, maybe to Witches Abroad, when you like the third act goes hard in this book as well, like, you know, in terms of set pieces, in terms of conflict and in terms of imagination as well i think it's 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 great yeah where, where to begin i guess with with <laughs> with, the, with with the date I, you know we were just talking about nanny and, and Nanny's appetite. wow yeah <laughs> 
what does she call the caviar um or the bramble jam a bramble jam tasted awfully <laughs> fishy she's just like necking it like by the spoonful uh love it and um actually what one of the things i like about love about casanonda is just how respectful he is he, um and there is a line about trying to play footsie and getting Nanny steel toe cap <laughs> on his ankle. Yeah, but, but that's pretty that's tame, kind of like you know, a, yeah. yeah, it's like a one off. He he's just content to sit there and and take her in. So yeah, I, I can get why that's your favorite coupling. It's just it's fun, and I, I I don't know, and that's not to say that I don't enjoy the granny and and Ridgely scenes. Um, but. I prefer Casanova probably as a suitor for anybody than than Ridgely, you know. Um, <laughs> but that's part. But that's part of what makes Ridgely good in his scenes is because he's so bad at it, and that and that's sort of charming in its own way. You know, he's so stuffy and old fashioned, and yeah. But Casanova is just content to, to sit and and take in being in Nanny's presence, and not that alone <laughs> makes him very happy and. Yeah, that's it's so endearing. Yeah. yeah, absolutely, it is. Yeah, you know they've gone off, and you can't go off on a romantic interlude, especially not in a Midsummer's Night Dream party, and um, without then things going immeasurably wrong. So, yeah, the unicorn actually we hadn't really talked about. Have a unicorn rant coming? Um, I'm, I'm surprised. So before you get into that, I might just look around because so where I'm sitting now, I've I've been evicted from my old office, and I'm now in what used to be my daughter's nursery. Uh, I would be amazed if there isn't a unicorn lurking somewhere in this room. Um, I've got no, I've got a Cinderella doll with no head. I don't know if anybody <laughs> can see that. Um, I've got I got a broken mermaid money box, but I don't actually appear to have any unicorns to hand. Honestly, I really despise unicorns. I think they're supremely arrogant. Um, so these are creatures that are one of a kind in a fictional setting, and and just how how self centric do you have to be to to have that? I'm fictional, but there's only one of me. I'm I'm a single species, and, and then they they spread out through the world in their stickers and their their posters and their little toys, um, uh, egotistical much. So I mean, uh, yeah. Speaking as somebody whose house is literally infested with unicorns, I could not agree more. Now you need to gather those all up, PJ. Apologize to your daughter. Let's take them outside, burn them all. <laughs> it's the only way to get rid of the devil. Uh, yeah, yeah. And actually, to have a unicorn as like part of that evil elfish kind of pantheon or whatever in this uh, in this story, I think was qu was quite interesting. Um, because like objectively, like it's kind of a scary idea. Like horses are scary. Like they're big and they're fast and they're strong. So if you put a pointy horn on one of their heads, like that that could absolutely mess people up. Yeah, no nowhere is that a hat. That is a horn. Um, meant for fighting with. Yeah. What is interesting, actually, I don't know, this is a bit of a tangent, might get cut. Uh since since the unicorn phase uh, in our house with the girls has sort of segued into narwhals, like, because narwhals are real. What is a narwhal? So a narwhal is a type of whale, but it has a massive horn, tusk thing coming out of its head. And that's a real animal. So like, obviously the girls get big into unicorns and then they find out unicorns aren't real. And then they find out that there is an animal that has a massive evil looking horn coming out of its head. And then they decide to get obsessed with that instead. But at least they're in the ocean, so they can't come and get you. It's yeah. uh, well, you know what a rhino could take down a unicorn easily. How many? Yeah, how many unicorns would it take to defeat a single rhino? I think a rhino could take down at least three unicorns. At least three unicorns, depending on the unicorn body and mass. But there's a the thing about unicorns: there's only one of them. Yet they keep <laughs> canonically, us, yeah, canonically they keep asking them. us to use a plural. Yeah, and that's another unicorn-based insidiousness. You see, but the unicorns um, are fast. Like one unicorn <laughs> flank, flanking attacks on the rhino. I think you know the rhino. He, he doesn't have much of a turning circle. You know, he's in trouble. I mean, rhino's got you know it's it's got mass and it's, <laughs> it can still get a bit of speed up. So you know a few bumps, even without uh, horn to horn connection, 
he could probably topple a more than one unicorn if more than one unicorn existed. If if he can hit them, if he can hit them, then that's the question. Yeah. We'd probably better get back to uh, Granny. Oh yeah, what's this? <laughs> what's this uh, podcast about? <laughs> Yeah, so what's happening in the old book then, I guess? Anything anything good? Anything exciting? Uh, yeah, pretty much everything. It's it's all kind of rushing towards uh, a really exciting third act, actually, in this in this one. We got proper rising speech, a proper Shakespearean speech from Sean at one stage, don't we? Yeah, um, that's that's a really, yeah, that's really cool, that. Yeah. A little help from his mom. I'm sure we could, could maybe check the annotated Pratchett here to see... Oh yeah, from Henry V. I feel like there's only like about three Shakespeare plays I can speak about with any kind of level of um, authority. None of them are referenced in this book. <laughs> so maybe the less said about that, the better. Um, I, w- I want to talk a bit about the entertainment. So not having Midsummer Night's Dream as clear in my memory as, as yourself, no, no, my I don't either, really. Like, honestly. But for me, no, I, I mentioned the Neil Gaiman version, and that's yeah. that's what it is to me now. It's, it's Shakespeare's been rewritten by Shakespeare. Bye. So yeah. there's what well, we, we've already had this. We've had this sort of masquerade of of reality. It was it was very much there in in Weird Sisters. Um, we've had it as realities competing as a key plot point in Mort. Mm-hmm. Um things, these sort of big universal changes, it's it's been done quite a few times in the yes. in these past Discord books. So by doing it pretty much off screen, we don't see the end. we I I think we well we get a little bit, we get maybe a page yes. of everything starts to change quite mm-hmm. massively and so you get that through the um the unseen university and you get oh, yeah, through yeah. the morris men um, and that's kind of about it and i was really glad that that is 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 minimized because we we don't need to see the actual event if we know about the consequences of it and yeah yeah um where it's going to and and those consequences do pay off in, in how Granny and others wrestle back control. Um, it's a concept that fascinates him for sure and does get used and hopefully it's not too much of a spoiler to say gets revisited in certain shapes and forms down the line, maybe soon, maybe later. And he finds different ways to attack it to, to sort of keep it feeling fresh and I think this is the first kind of experiment with that, like of minimizing it and as you say playing stuff off screen and focusing on the consequences i think really yeah really really helps here as you say from from making it feel a, a bit semi um and then i guess eventually like that's all building up to Magrat finally getting her her moment as it were you know get getting down to the armory and um getting inspired by the warrior queen well, i was just it. looking at my note to see if i'd uh, uh, first draft of these was uh, My Grat Goes Rambo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's really, um, it's My Grat Goes Boudicca, I guess, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And because again, like a very, very, very limited knowledge of British Celtic mythology. Uh, but ah. her, um, yeah, Boudicca fights Romans, I want to say. That's right, isn't it? And I think there is something. I think there's a nice tidbit somewhere in the annotated project about this, about the name, because it's the name is Incy, is it? Is that how you how would yeah. you say it? I would say Incy, and I was like, is it like Incy Wincy Spider? Or <laughs> oh. I don't know. I don't think that's right, <laughs> but it just it's the first thing that, that popped to mind. Uh see if I can search for it. This is an interesting part that Incy didn't exist. That so yeah. just the the idea of her that has inspired. Margaret has tapped into something within her story. Yeah. It's oh, I find it. Story. I find it. Boudicca's husband was the ruler of a tribe called the Ikeni, which is almost in spelled backwards. As oh. like, I didn't make that observation. That's from the annotated project. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, as you were saying before I interrupted you, the 
the power of belief. It uh, just comes down again. One of those recurring motifs in this world is about the power of belief, and it doesn't matter. It just doesn't matter that NC wasn't real because Magrat believes in her. Right, right, and it's yeah, it's power stories as well. Um, like uh, I, I remember sort of, you know, when I was a kid and I was riding my BMX, and I used to think it was in the A team. And so all that sort of dynamism that you associate with the A team, like a the theme tune and the actions and stunts and stuff. And I was putting all that power into my leg muscles when I was turning the, the BMX pedals. Yeah, yeah. And it's just you're tapping into a story that's totally, totally. The the Discworld equivalent of that is uh, <laughs> my grab marching off the war in her cookware armor. <laughs> oh, and does she do a number in those elves like of violence? So yeah, so satisfying, um, but again, John you know, is shocked, isn't he? The balance, but the balance is right because, like, they've been built up as such an intimidating force that, yeah. like, you need that release of tension to ha and that cathartic moment where, like, yeah, somebody just goes absolutely to town on them. And you're thinking yeah. because it's maybe it's going to be Sean, but it's so much better that it's Magrat. Yeah, you know, it's a nice little bit. And they really are one of the nastier Discworld villains we've had to that point, and they're they're so indirect about it. Yes, and something I've maybe moaned about a little bit in the past because the early, you know, the dungeon dimension thingies never really sat right with me as as credible Discworld villains because I I was spoiled, you know, I was used to like the the auditors and the elves and the, all these like really good, properly meaty, scary villains. I guess you know. I wonder should we go into part five or part five? I've got a great big tonker. Set, set me up to say that, didn't you? <laughs> Pages 307 to 380. In the caves, Nanny meets the King of Elves. Magrat fights in the forest with a gorilla gorilla. See what he did there. And leads the way to the castle, where she organizes the village into a fighting force. Granny is tormented by the Queen. Even as she tries to reason with her, Magrat serves a beat down. The King arrives, Granny it and dead, and Magrat gets married. Even you slip back into Granny there at the end. You wrote Granny for the last one. Um, the, the caves beneath uh, Langer. Um, yeah, yeah, there's more of that sort of, a bit of that moving pictures era, subterranean stuff. I suppose we're still in that era. But also, like, uh, the great sort of English uh, monument and chalk marking sort of stuff. The whole Stonehengeism. Yeah, I think you know for the whole time that Lanker has been in the story, we've you get that sense that that's what it is. It's just it's the entire English countryside kind of just like scrunched down into this tiny little you know minuscule kingdom thing. Um, so yeah, so it's it's not something as I said before that I'm totally knowledgeable about, but like the imagery at least is familiar. So you you have that shorthand of yeah, like you say the. The, the chalk drawings with the great big talkers <laughs> and uh and linking that into our familiar understanding our inverted understanding of like fairy folk and stuff like that it does feel like a really coherent mythology even though he doesn't spend a huge amount of time dwelling on it or explaining it doesn't have to and yeah anytime nanny talks about people's bits it's just hilarious <laughs> And also something I don't think, sorry, um, that I don't think I understood particularly well at the time. I find the dynamic, I think, between the king and queen of elves a bit confusing, and that's obviously uh, Oberon and Titania, Midsummer Night's Dream riff, I guess, on the kind of the love-hate relationship between the king and queen of the fairies. Because otherwise, you know, so I just find all, all this a little bit confusing, I think, the first time around. Um, but now it sort of makes sense, I guess, as a kind of, as a, a parody. I'm, I'm feeling uh, I got off lucky in not reading this in Cloak's proximity to Midsummer Night's Dream. I'd say, like, as with all of these, I think arguably it's maybe better if you don't, if you just enjoy these for what they are and you don't have to worry so much about the, the, the Shakespeare of it all, you know, because I think most, well, certainly for us, for people who kind of came up UK education system, like when you're exposed to it, I, probably arguably too early in age, you either love it or you hate it, you know? So it's kind of a big risk to to hang so many of your stories around Shakespeare. <laughs> Perhaps, you know, especially if you are maybe trying to attract a young audience and you're writing comedy books and stuff like that. But again, 
you write what you love and you write what you know and, and Terry obviously has a huge amount of affection for and respect for Shakespeare so you know that's why he's a much better writer than I am. <laughs> In terms of uh, structure, we get we get a few conclusions, and the first one is the big one: the the um, the, the march on the elf camp where Granny is being held captive and tortured and um, just just tormented generally. Um, she's yeah. going to be kept alive while and, and made to watch while Magrat is um, killed and. Actually, you know, I knew my grant was going to be okay, and I knew Granny was going to be okay, mm. but on both occasions, there was just that nagging voice that, no, no. Yeah, I think part of the whole, is the coven going to break up, is my grant going to become queen thing? <coughs> that set up at the beginning does... I think the intention behind that is to try to give you the sense that anything could happen. That if the coven's going to break up anyway, what if Granny dies? Or certainly if not Granny, what if my grad dies? You're thinking, is yeah. she going to become queen? Is she going to become a witch? You know, there's a potential twist there where actually neither. She's going to die. The, the my grad thing felt much closer to the knuckles, actually, yes. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. A Granny thing, I'm wondering, well, how does she, there's a bit of how does she get out of it? But the, the the Magrat stuff felt really like it was going for a final sort of suffocation hold. The writing was just that strong in that direction. Yes, it's very, very visceral for sure. And I think there are moments here and there that he sort of tries to set up that Gr Granny does have this sort of gnawing sense of dread or that something's maybe not 100% right. And that turns out to be kind of a quantum trousers of time kind of thing. But... I think there's there maybe a sense there that, oh, if Granny thinks something might actually go wrong here, then maybe it really will. And the elves are, as to say, so well established as this almost like unconquerable force that like once they've got you, that's it for you. You know, you can't let them get you because then it's game over. And Granny and my grad both get got. <laughs> so, the, yeah, the stakes couldn't be higher. And there's so many people in the mix with this, this big finale. I mean, obviously the centre of the... The storm is is the, the queen and granny and Magrat. Um Yeah, yeah, it's it feels feels high stakes. Yeah, yeah, and it's good. I mean, you know, like the whole the king and the queen thing, because because at least Nanny's involved in that. You know, it doesn't feel like too much of a Deus Ex Machina that like the elves basically just you know descend into infighting or whatever. You know that that's all prompted by by Nanny at least, and. To me, it mirrors the jewel in the square a little bit, where like Granny's the one having the direct confrontation, where Nanny's kind of off to the side pulling strings, like she did with with Pusey, you know, to kind of to bring an end to the jewel. She's off pulling strings here with the king to kind of bring an end yeah. to the elves. And I don't know if that's like if that's a deliberate kind of motif or whatever, but. It sort of felt, you know, in terms of their roles, in terms of the dynamic between Granny and Nanny, that there does feel like there's a bit of symmetry there. Yeah, yeah. By the time the the king comes in to to end the battle, a lot of the the major moves have already taken uh, part, mm. and and the seeds for what comes after that, the, the the get out clauses have already been been laid, and those things are in motion too. I yeah. don't know. What would have happened if the king hadn't come down? I don't think things would have gone quite so well, but it was still quite satisfying. I mean, the biggest thing that's kind of paid off here that we alluded to earlier is that, like, Granny essentially trained or kind of molded my grad in a particular way for this very moment. And that almost retroactively justifies the way that she's treated and the way that that she has become the person that she became so that she could kind of save the kingdom or whatever from, from the elves. It, it did throw me quite a bit that Granny had written letters to Varence from Genoa. Mm. It struck me as quite, um, on my first, on my read, it's, first read it struck me as quite uh, unfairly manipulative of Granny mm. to have done that. And then on my second read, it struck me as, well, yes, yeah, still manipulative, but kind of 
just right. She nails Magrat you know, just just right if Magrat had have arrived home and Varens hadn't been, you know, had, had started setting up um you know, delaying or stalling things or doing it in proper order, then Magrat would have sort of had wobbles of plant D. She would have found ways to convince herself to get out of it. Um, maybe using the witchery as an excuse. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. That's very us all, Magrat. Yeah, but it's equally like the way Granny engineered that absolutely is manipulative. And I think that's always kind of the, the tightrope back that Granny is is on is that she is so sure in herself that she knows what's best for people that she occasionally kind of takes her agency away from them and she does have her moments of self-doubt and she does have her moments where she questions whether she's gone too far and she knows that like if she makes mistakes it has serious serious consequences for people and in this case like people that she really cares about she's not so, doing headology on Verence. he does make his own mind up yeah, I mean, I think it was clear from their last encounter that like Varence absolutely wanted to, I mean, he wanted to marry Magrat for sure. Um, and I don't think, I think it's actually stated probably outright in the book somewhere that like Magrat has absolutely no qualms about marrying Varence either, but she doesn't necessarily want to be queen. Like, yeah, she tells Millie that like when she fell in love with him, he was a fool and like they, he, she would have happily married him as a fool, not as a, as a king. So Granny knew that she had to do what she had to do to make the marriage happen because Varence was king, but there's no other way to describe it except manipulative. That's exactly what it is. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of Granny putting her affairs in order, which we've also had before, but this is, I think this is a big one. Uh, she's, she's died, but, oh no, she hasn't. She's been with the swarm, which we've seen seated right through the book for granny through mr brooks yeah uh, it's been a great mastery thing um and I, I love her whole return and 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 speaking like a bee and, <laughs> yeah. and the sugar and, so so creepy and it's, uh, it's hilarious actually listening to nigel planer do this bit because I bet. He, he he does a whole book quite rapidly and for this bit he has to really map out his head and slow <laughs> very good yeah oh yeah that's class actually yeah i mean i also remember vaguely thinking that was a bit of a cop out back in the day but i think on a reread as you say the beads are are really well set up you know and the fact that granny is able to borrow the hive mind like it's it's sort of it shows her power and like when when you see her as a young woman who was coveted by the elf queen you go like well yeah granny granny's a real deal you know she's a really powerful force in this world in this story and the, the fact that she can actually take over a hive mind is is kind of terrifying <laughs> and we get a, a rather hastily thrown together wedding um with none of those eggy pies <laughs> yeah. quiche, of course indeed oh yeah what's the make make my quiche is that what the or bake my case, yeah. Go ahead, bake my case, yeah. Good, yeah. Good line, yeah. John D. quotes, John D. Bright spots. Um, yeah, well, I mean, my quote is right at the end. Oh, nice. Um, I, I didn't do a full search on the quote, there's so many good ones, yeah. Um, I think it's a nanny. Oh, here we go. Um, so this is page 362, about 20 pages from the end. Uh -huh. Um, what, oh, yes, where's the groom? He's a bit muzzy, not sure what happened, said Magrat. Perfectly normal, said Nanny, after a stag night. <laughs> that is just the setup on that. That's like 300 <laughs> plus pages of setup to get to that punchline. Uh, uh, it just nearly knocked me off my chair. Iconic. Uh, yeah. So I don't have a quote as such, but like the set piece, and it was one of the few like bits that I remembered almost line for line uh on my second reading was when um Varence tries to get the order of the book about marital arts <laughs> <laughs> and then the book about martial arts arrives and and sean is out doing karate and then for the rest of the book sean's practicing karate <laughs> and just every time it gets called back to it just made me laugh again uh and that because uh, it fed into like Varence's sensibleness, I guess, and then like he he did he took a punt on going trying to get a book that was a bit racy and it backfired on him. 
but just the fact that Sean is oblivious to it and is like delighted that he gets to practice karate as a result. There's a, a couple of pieces that are sort of like almost like arranged as free verse. Yeah. Um, um, quality of elves and there's oh there's a bit yeah there's a bit about the quality of elves it's. Uh, I've got um, that. I found it somewhere. Elves are wonderful. They provoke wonder. Elves are marvelous. They cause marvels. Elves are fantastic. They create fantasies. Elves are glamorous. They project glamour. Elves are enchanting. They weave enchantment. Elves are terrific. They beget terror. Yeah, and that's like, oh, that's not even the end of it. The thing about words is that meanings can twist just like a snake. And if you want to find snakes, look for them behind words that have changed their meaning. No one ever said elves are nice. Elves are bad. So yeah, that, I mean, yeah, in terms of summer, summing up like who you're up against, like what, what the forces of antagonism are in this book, like that's, it's pretty and, terrifying. <laughs> and, and unicorns are also bad. That's actually their, their true form. Oh yeah. Well, that's what different. a unicorn really, really looks like. <laughs> for, for audio only listeners, it's a, I want to say a Stegosaurus, Triceratops. It's, it's a, a very Triceratops. ugly animal. Yeah. Yeah, it's a dinosaur. Have you got my, more my toys gerbils have been trained to take down unicorns. That's why some of the stumps at the top of this dinosaur are oh, nice. a bit less yeah. and sharp. They've just torn chunks out of them. So yeah, um, if you have a unicorn problem, get some gerbils, turn them into a fighting force. It's the only way. It is the only way. So what's um what's going on in the world of of Andy and things non 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 this world related. Andy is preparing to move house, so this is the last podcast in this current location. Um, when we did moving pictures, you may remember we talked about our local version of Hollywood and um, uh-huh. moving from Belfast to Hollywood, which is so it's only about twenty minutes away, but it's a bit of a different vibe. Yeah, um, I'm preparing to launch my uh, YouTube channel. So okay. I to uh, to relaunch it actually. It, it, there's some great stuff up there. Short films have made on activism, some short comedy stuff. Um, but I'm I'm relaunching it um uh, probably a couple of days from when this airs, St. Patrick's Day, with um short 200 second reviews of Always Sunny in Philadelphia. And a couple of weeks after that, we'll be doing short reviews on Doctor Who. And I've put a lot of work into them, and I hope you enjoy them. So if you get to youtube.com forward slash at Andrew Luke, and I'd really appreciate a subscription. Um, You don't even have to hit the bell notification icon. Just give me a subscribe, and that will help me get on my way to putting some money in the bank for this endeavor. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it's really fun too. Yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. Uh, two shows that I actually have to catch up on. So it gives me an excuse to to do that. Um, oh, yeah. I see you've, you've got a radio be... thing coming up. I do. And I think I possibly gave out the wrong date last time. I yeah, I think you the, did. The show. I put it in my so, diary and oh, that's not, that's an odd day. I mean, it is, a, it is a Sunday. I think I just gave the wrong Sunday. So, yeah, John Maher's The Devil's Own on BBC Radio 4 produced by me, PJ Hart, is going out at quarter past seven on Sunday the 21st of April. Is that right? Yep, that sounds right. Now, at least we have a chance probably to put out one more podcast before that goes to air. So if I've got the date right a second time, I've got one last chance to correct it. Uh, But keep an eye out for that. If you miss it because I've given you the wrong date or because you've got better things to do with your life, it will also be on BBC Sounds. Super duper. Um, we are, oh, I, I should, I do this. I've started doing this again, which is, is good because I want to thank some of my top patrons who helped me make my art. Um, that's Arsalan Hyder Ali, Art K, and particularly Ian Lawler, who goes halfers with me on the bill for the, the Zoom, as we used to do this. And actually, I'm behind on my payments. So um, soon, Ian, soon. Thank you so much. We love you, mate. And a big thanks to the Pratchett podcast for retweets and uh, help promoting the pod. I've never read Discworld. Uh, and I just remembered they have a Spotify voice message feature. So if you couldn't be arsed, like, send us an email, go and record a voice message on there and we'll we'll stick it on air. I'd love to, I'd love to do that with you. 
Yeah, bear in mind if you do send us a voice message, we'll almost certainly put it in the pod. So just bear that bear that in mind. Another one done and dusted, Andy. Now that we're we're into this rich vein that Mark told us about, you're you're excited, you're raring mm-hmm. to go. Yeah, so I I because my all my Discord books are in boxes. I got a, a Discord box. I had to haul out the next one, which I know is Men at Arms. Uh, back to the watch. Back to the watch. Um, yeah, so that's reason enough to be excited. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I sort of feel like I was a bit unsure about how to tackle Guards Guards. I was intimidated about tackling Guards Guards because it, it's one of my favorite books of all time. So I feel like we'll hopefully have a bit more of a nuanced discussion about the watch series when we get into men at arms next month so stay tuned for that that's great um i love reading discord yay